God said ask. And I just felt in Isaiah 60 that this was God's answer to what is on our hearts, what the, what the crime of hearts is. And this was God's response. And he says in Isaiah 60, Arise and shine, your light has come. And the glory of the Lord rises upon you. See, darkness covers the earth, and thick darkness is over the people. But the Lord rises upon you, and his glory appears over you. Nations will come to your light, and kings to the brightness of your glory. Thank you, Father, that as we ask, as you put things in our heart to ask of you, that your response is yes and amen. I thank you for the season of joy to the nations, for your glory is upon us, as you have promised in Isaiah, and that, Father, nations will find you. Nations will find you, that this place will be a place that carries the glory of God, a place where the glory of God resides, a place where the glory of God is so ever-present, where the glory of God touches us, reforms us, transforms us, sets us free, heals us, and strengthens us and empowers us. We thank you, Father, for your promise that the nations will be sent to where your glory is. Something happens in our hearts when we worship you like that. We get strengthened. We, uh, we just uh, feel so much closer to you. So we bless you for song. 
We bless you for these musicians who've served us week after week since we've started gathering again. Thank you, Lord Jesus, that uh, your presence is here with us to show us the way to encourage and strengthen and to, to correct and direct as well as the word comes to us just now. So we bless you, Father. We say we love you. And we thank you that, as Linda read that scripture, what we ask to a loving Father, you hear our cries to you this morning. And we can know that you will shift the heavens for us. We bless you, Father. Amen. Right. Morning, friends. So lovely to see you this morning. And it's my privilege to be bringing God's word. And the title of my sermon is, Why Jesus? Why Jesus? Shall we close our eyes as we take some time to pray? Lord Jesus, we have sang so beautifully about your goodness, about your greatness, about how the nations adore you. And we pray, Lord, this morning that we want to exalt your name and give you the praise and the honor that is due to your name. And I would ask, Holy Spirit, that would you help me lift up this name that is above all other names. And I pray that Holy Spirit would help me to do justice, to speak about the greatness and the goodness of our God. I pray these things in Jesus' name. And the church say, Amen. Amen. Charles Spurgeon says a wonderful phrase, or he is known to have uh, said this quote. He says, the gospel is like a caged lion. It doesn't need to be defended. It simply needs to be let out of its cage. And I feel like that this morning, that we cannot defend Jesus, or I cannot defend Jesus. What I want to simply do this morning is to release him from his cage, and an encounter with him will forever change our lives. And you see, friends, it's possible to put Jesus in a cage. It's possible to to view him incorrectly. And we, we put Jesus in a cage when we have wrong perceptions or when we have wrong ideas about who he is. And, and one, one example that uh, you can look at is how we celebrate his birth. You might have wondered what are some of our priorities during this time? Huh? Food, clothes, spending time with family. And while all these things are good and are a wonderful way of celebration, sometimes it's possible to miss out the purpose or the heart of the season. And the heart of the season, friends, is that unto us a child was given. Unto us the greatest gift the world has ever received was given. And parents, may I encourage you that do not let this Christmas pass by without sharing the birth of Jesus by the Virgin Mary to your kids. And that's the best gift that we can give to our kids. And you might want to dismiss me already this morning and you say, but Gerald, why are you talking about putting Jesus in a cage? I am born again. I know Jesus. I've got a relationship with him. And I say, before you dismiss me, may I remind you what Paul says to the Ephesians church. He says, I pray that God will give you a spirit of wisdom and a spirit of revelation that you may know him better. And he was talking to people who were born again, spirit filled, who were recommended for faith and love. So all of us friends, we need, we could do with God removing the fog. We could do with God breaking the cages that we have, the misconceptions and the wrong ideas that we have about Jesus. And so to help us have a clear view of who Jesus is, would you please turn with me to the book of Matthew chapter 16 from verse 13 to 20. Now this is a famous story and I trust that as we go along and unpack some things, uh, God will do only that which he can. 
which is to remove the fog and help us to see Jesus for who he is. This is what scripture says. Scripture says, when Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say the son of man is? They replied, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and still others, Jeremiah or one of the prophets. But what about you? He asked, who do you say I am? Simon Peter answered, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. Jesus replied, blessed are you, Simon, of, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by flesh and blood, but by my Father in heaven. And I tell you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. And whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Then he ordered his disciples not to tell anyone that he was the Messiah. And can I, can you, can you imagine this for a second? If I were to come to you today and say, who do people say that I am? You may probably answer me and say, Gerald, forget the people. I myself don't know who you are. And Jesus asks this question to the people. Unlike me, he had made an impression to the people. Unlike me, Jesus was well known. Unlike me, Jesus was very popular in his time. And so when he asked this question, the disciples knew that this man, he had an impact in the community, and obviously people had something to say. And this tells me something. It tells me that everything that Jesus said and everything that Jesus did, he did it with an intention, or he was very deliberate in directing his audience to come to this question. He was very deliberate in saying things, in doing things, so that they can come to this place where they can answer this question. Who do you say that I am? And Luke says in the, in the book of Acts chapter 10, verse 38, that how anointed was Jesus Christ of Nazareth with power that he went about doing good, healing all that were, were sick. Why? Because God was with him. And what Luke is trying to tell us, he's summarizing the ministry of Jesus. And he says, Jesus went about doing good. But why did he do that? He did that so that his audience could be brought to this question. Who do you say that I am? And when he asked this question, the disciples responded and they said, well, some say that you are John the Baptist and others say that you are Elijah and some still say that you are Jeremiah or one of the prophets. And it's, it's quite interesting when you read this passage because John the Baptist had been killed by Herod. And for the people to have a perception that Jesus was John the Baptist was kind of weird, isn't it? And, and it tells me they had an idea that this John the Baptist had somehow resurrected to life and he's still continuing in his ministry. I find it strange. And they say, it's like Elijah. And Elijah is that famous prophet who is known for calling down fire from heaven. And the Bible had promised something special about Elijah. The Bible had said, before the Messiah comes, there's going to be a forerunner who is going to come. And he's going to come in the spirit of Elijah. He's going to prepare the way for the Messiah. And Jeremiah is known as a weeping prophet or a prophet of doom. And we see Jesus, when he speaks to the audience, he would cry and he would weep over cities. And so some had this perception and say, he's probably a prophet like Jeremiah. And friends, what they were trying to communicate is that Jesus 
is a forerunner and he is not the one. They were trying to say Jesus is the forerunner, he is not the one. Now, there is a contest that I like to watch from time to time and it's called a beauty pageant contest. And what happens is that uh, there is one person at the end of the night or the end of the event, there is only one girl who is going to be crowned. And so when the people meet and the people gather for this event, they all have this one anticipation that there is going to be one person who is going to be crowned. And when that person is crowned, they become the queen or they become the Miss Universe and they become whatever. But interestingly enough, they have got what is called the first or the second runner-up. And the first and the second runner-up is not the crowned one. They don't get to be crowned. They are the first or the second. In other words, they are quite special. We can see that there is some form of beauty or skill, but they are not the one. And so what the Jews were communicating is that they see Jesus as the first runner-up or the second runner-up. They are saying, we can tell that Jesus is good. We can tell by his acts. We can tell by, by the miracles that he's doing. They say, he's a runner-up. He is not the one. And I like the response of the disciples. And I think they were very kind to Jesus because they are only giving these nice examples and good, uh, uh, I think, pictures of prophets in the Bible. But you and I, we know that in Scripture, some people confronted Jesus to his face. The Jews said to him, you are a liar. You are a deceiver. They accused him and they said, you cast out devils using the power of Satan. And what were they saying? They were saying, listen, we don't buy your stuff for one bit. We think you are a liar. You are a deceiver. And you and I, we also know that the Bible tells us that at one point, Jesus' family thought that he was out of his mind. And they said, let us go and seize him. And let us take him back home and try to talk some sense into him. He has gone mad. And the disciples didn't mention that. But friends, it's true. These are the views that the people had of Jesus. He was a liar. He was a lunatic. Oh, he was the first or second runner up. And friends, may I suggest that our generation is like these people here. We see Jesus as some this good guy. We see Jesus as, as someone who is, who is special and different, but he is not yet the crowned one. He is not yet the one in our lives. And God is asking us this question this morning. Who do you say that I am? When the disciples had answered like this, Jesus brought the attention from the crowds and he brought it to them and he said, well, thank you for the perspectives of the crowds. What about you, my inner circle? Who do you say I am? And friends, I want to suggest that Jesus was trying to communicate to us that this question is a universal question. This question has to be answered by each and every one of us. It's an inexcusable question. We cannot deny, we cannot duck away from this question. We have to come at some point in our lives where we have to answer this question. Who do you say that I am? And when saying this, this is what the Bible says. The Bible says, Peter jumped to the question and he said, You are the Messiah. The son of the living God. I don't know about you, but if it was me, I was going to say, boy, high five. Well done. This is the best answer ever. 
But Jesus doesn't say so. He says, Peter, Peter, blessed are you, son of Jonah, for flesh and blood did not reveal this to you. And this is Peter, the answer you have just given me is not yours. It did not come from you. It's my Father in heaven who has told you of who I am. And I want to say, friends, I want to say, friends, the question of who do you say Jesus is is not an academic one. It's a relational one. Who do you say that Jesus is? It's not an answer that we can just give and say, ah, we think he's Lord and he's Messiah and he's the Son of God and we continue. It has got consequences, friends. It has got relational consequences if you answer that way. And Jesus says, what you have said, it's my Father who has revealed this to you. And I want to suggest, friends, that we cannot see Jesus unless God himself opens our eyes to see him for who he is. We cannot see Jesus unless God himself. And my prayer, friends, is that God would open our eyes and remove all the clutter and remove all the misconceptions that we have about him. And what was Peter confessing? As we conclude, what was Peter confessing when he said, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God? We know in scripture that these declarations or these uh, confessions were not the first time uh, that the disciples had said so. Uh, we know that when Andrew was inviting his brother Peter uh, to follow Jesus, he said, come, for I have met the Messiah. So this Confession was not new, but what is Peter communicating here? Now, we know that in this context, the Jews were being ruled by Romans, and they had promises of a Messiah who was going to come. And what that meant, or what the Messiah was going to do, was to rescue them. And what they thought was that the Messiah was going to uh, kind of come and be a form of a politician, like a grant, who will start to mobilize people <laughs> and, 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 thereby, and thereby rescue the Jewish, the Jewish people from the Roman uh, oppression. So Messiah had these uh, connotations in it of a rescuer, or someone who would come in the rescue. And the term son of God meant Someone coming from God or someone out of God. And what Peter was conveying is that Jesus is divine. In other words, Peter was confessing or he was declaring and he was saying that Jesus is the rescuer and Jesus is the God-man. He is divine. And upon this, Jesus said, it's not you, Peter. It's my father who has revealed this to you. And what Jesus was saying, in other words, is that this is what my Father in heaven says I am. I am a rescuer. I am the God-man. I am divine. And friends, as we answer the question, who do we say Jesus is? May I suggest and propose to us, he is the rescuer. He is the one who rescues us. And he is divine. He is God himself. And I want to ask you this question is, I close. Who do you say that Jesus is? Is he your rescuer? If he is your rescuer, when was the last time you cried out to him and say, rescue me? When was the last time you fell on your knees and you said, please Jesus, come through for me? This is what David says. He said, this poor man cried out to the Lord and he delivered me out of all my troubles. And I want to suggest, friends, that those things that torment our soul, those things that keep us in bondage, Jesus is standing today and he's saying, I am your rescuer. And this morning we heard these words, ask, 
seek, knock. And I'd like to challenge us and say, are we crying out to our rescuer? For he is able. He is able. His word this morning is, I am able to rescue you. And the second thing, friends, is he the crowned one in our lives? Is he the center of all focus? Is he the center of all our activity? And if he is, when was the last time we bowed down the knee and acknowledged that he is God? If he is who, he is who we claim he is, when was the last time, friends, we bowed down and surrendered to him? This means, when did we give up our will for his will? This means, when did we put our interest down so that he might reign. This is what John the Baptist says. He says, may I decrease so that he might increase. And friends, if Jesus is the son of the living God, if Jesus is God as we claim him to be, then we must bend the knee. And as I conclude, probably you are here this morning and you haven't bowed down your knee. To Jesus. Probably you are here and as I was speaking, God was stirring some things in your heart and you are saying, would you surrender to the great rescuer who would like to rescue you? If that is you, we would love the privilege of praying for you this morning. And without wasting much time, if that is you, would you just show me by raising up your hand and we would love to pray for you. Can I ask that we stand, church? Same. If that is you who say, I would like to respond to Jesus for the first time, I would like to bow my knee, I would like him to come and rescue me, would you just pop up your hand and we would like to pray for you? Thank you, I see those hands. Can I ask you to be bold and courageous enough? Would you please come to the front? would like to pray and really ask the great rescuer to come and rescue your soul. Come, my brother. <laughs> Friends, Scripture says there is much rejoicing. And, and there is much joy. Scripture says there is much joy in heaven and there is rejoicing when knees bow and confess that Jesus is the great rescuer. And so friends, thank you for being bold and courageous. I know that the Holy Spirit is already at work in your hearts. And what we want to do it's just like David who said, this poor man cried out to the Lord and the Lord delivered him from all of his troubles. And I've, I've, I know this is what scripture says, that when we cry out to him, he rescues us and he comes through for us. So I'm going to ask you together with the church to just pray this prayer uh, after me as we trust and declare the name of Jesus. Church, can we help? These friends of ours who are bowing their knees to the King of Kings for the first time. Say, Lord Jesus, I believe in my heart that you are the great rescuer and that you are God. In other words, you are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. I surrender my life to you today. Would you come in and reign and have your way? I declare that you died for me on the cross and you rose again on the third day. And thank you for, for such love and sacrifice. In Jesus' name. In the church, say, Amen. shall we praise God first for the
I'm going to ask you to follow Roy, Linda. Uh, as you go just to that outside area, they would like to connect with you and chat to you and uh, pray for you further. And if you've got any uh, prayer requests, please chat to them. Shall we just give God an applause as they do so? And friends, this is the gospel message to us this morning. Would you surrender to the King of Kings? Would you declare him to be your great rescuer? I don't know. I don't know the stuff that is trying to entangle you. But this is the message this morning that Jesus Christ would like to set you free. And when we cry out to him, he is divine and he is able to break all those chains. And shall we just lift up our hands and we cry out to the King of Kings. Lord Jesus, we thank you that you are mighty to save. We thank you, Lord, that there is nothing that is too hard for you. And we cry out to you, Lord, that would you rescue us. And we pray, Lord, that would you set us free, Lord, that we might walk in the freedom that you have purchased for us. We declare you that you are the Lord of our lives this morning. And we pray, Lord, for those areas that are not surrendered to you. We pray, Holy Spirit, would you help us? We'd love to surrender all, to surrender everything to the King of Kings. So thank you, Lord. Have your way in us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen.